is a great day, but I think that today is especially great because we have the opportunity to celebrate with those um, who have made the decision to be baptized. Now, these people have decided to put their faith completely in Jesus and go public with it, saying, I'm going to live for Jesus and his ways the rest of my life. And so we're going to end service today with some baptisms. In the 8 o'clock, um, we had eight baptisms. We've got four baptisms here in the 930. And in the 11 o'clock, we have 27 baptisms. <clears throat> yes. So I'm going to do my best to preach a short message as we kick off a new series in the book of Jonah. And this isn't going to be a typical sermon um, because we've got to keep it short with these 27 baptisms in the 11 o'clock. Um, but the problem is that short and weaver don't go together, okay? Um, so let's just uh, open up with a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, help me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <laughs> so to, uh, to sum up the story of Jonah, for those unfamiliar with it, uh, Jonah was a prophet of God, meaning he was a messenger of God. And God asked Jonah to go to a wicked city to tell them about God's love for them and to instruct them to repent or to turn from their wicked ways and, and that God loved them and wanted to be in a relationship with them. And Jonah was like, no, I'm not going to do this. So he decides that his way is better. He boards a ship and he heads the opposite direction of where the city of Nineveh is. God sends a giant storm to this ship, and eventually he gets thrown overboard. God sends a fish, swallows Jonah whole, and Jonah spends three days in the belly of this fish, and he repents, and he prays his prayer, and then he's spit up onto the shore where God gives him then again a second chance to obey, and he goes and he preaches to the people of Nineveh. They turn from their wicked ways, and uh, it ends up being just a beautiful story. So I would encourage you this week in, in your um, study, Jonah is a very short book. It's a page and a half. It's four chapters. It's real short. Read it for yourselves. Get all the other details. There's tons of details I left out, but it's a great. It's actually probably my third favorite Old Testament book behind Genesis and Joshua. Genesis has so much. Joshua has so much. Jonah, I just, I've always Love the story. And growing up as a kid, I remember thinking, how awesome is it that a dude got swallowed by a fish? And then I got a little older, I'm like, that's disgusting, right? And then I got a little bit older and I started to have some questions. Is it really possible for someone to be swallowed whole by a fish and live three days in the belly of a fish? Like, did this story really take place? Has anybody ever asked those questions? Like, man, this seems like a tall tale if I've ever heard one, right? Um, I believe that it, it personally really did happen. I, I personally believe that. But there have been many arguments and many theories as to whether or not this story was real or if it was completely allegorical. I've actually heard Christian theologians that say that this is 100% an allegory. It's a parable. I've even heard one um, theologian that tried to explain that when sailors were lost at seas due to not being able to, to see the constellation and the stars at night, that they would consider that being swallowed up. Um, I personally believe that this really happened. I believe that there really was a man named Jonah. And I think in looking at history, we can actually see some evidence uh, that, that points to this story really happening. The book of Jonah was written in the 8th century B.C. In fact, he and my dad played on the same basketball team together. <laughs> They're good buds. 8th century B.C., and uh, he was a prophet uh, to the northern kingdom of Israel. He's recorded in the book of 2 Kings as being that prophet. He's only one of two uh, prophets to the northern kingdom. Most of the other prophets are the southern kingdom, uh, Hosea was the other northern kingdom prophet, and uh, his ministry uh, uh, occurred shortly after that of the prophet Elisha, and then Amos follows uh, Jonah's ministry. Now, it's very interesting 
that it's recorded in Assyrian history that during the reign of King Adad Nirari III, who was in the 8th century, that the city of Nineveh made this massive sweep turning from polytheism to monotheism, meaning turning from worshiping multiple gods, which was the Assyrian, the Babylonian ways, worshiping lots of gods, to monotheism, worshiping one god. I, I personally wholeheartedly believe that Jonah was a real person, and we even see the effects of his ministry in Assyrian history. Um, there's a lot of evidence that, that points to that, but I think for me, the reason why I choose to believe that this story really did happen is because the moment that we take out the miraculous um, of Scripture, it opens up the door to take out all of the miraculous and the supernatural of all Scripture. Okay, let's think about the Bible here for a second. We're talking creation, God speaking. We're talking about a Savior born of a virgin. We're talking about a resurrection, someone dying and being raised to life. We're talking about Jesus multiplying food or turning water into wine. We're talking about donkeys talking. We're talking about walls coming down in Jericho. We're talking about someone so strong he can push pillars down on, on his enemies and, and, and push it down. And, and if we begin to rationalize and try to explain away some of the supernatural of the body, then where do we stop? It becomes a very slippery slope. So that's why I choose to believe uh, that, that this really took place. But the real miracle of the story isn't that he survived three days in a fish. The real miracle of the story is that there's a God who loves all people of all nations and wants to be in a relationship with them. It's the miracle of salvation. I've got one main thought that I'm hoping will stick with you this morning, and that's this. It's all about Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's all about Jesus. Now turn to that neighbor that you like less because you ignored them and say, it's all about Jesus. And everything in this story, the story of Jonah, is about Jesus. Now, I felt growing up that uh, the story was more about obedience and obedience to God. I remember being taught something along the lines of this. Don't be like Jonah, obey God the first time. Anybody kind of grow up with that? Like, don't, don't, be, don't be a Jonah, just obey God the first time. And I heard people talk more about Jonah than they talked about God in reading the book of Jonah. Now, don't uh, mishear me this morning. I don't deny that there is definitely a lesson about obedience in the book of Jonah. And I don't deny that Jonah is a main character. After all, um, the book is called Jonah. But if all we do is focus uh, while reading scriptures, and all we do is focus on how does this apply to me, then we can miss out on the real intention of this text. Ask, to your, ask yourself this question, answer this question to yourself this morning. What is the main purpose of the Bible. What's, what's the main purpose of Scripture? Now, for some people, they might answer that and they say, well, the Bible is a uh, moral handbook. It, it is um, a Christian's moral handbook. And there's definitely some truth to that. Okay, the Bible does lay out God's best for your life. It lays out God's best for my life. But the main purpose of the Bible is to reveal the character of God. That's, that's the whole purpose of the Bible, is to show people who God is. Reading the Bible is the best way that we get to know God. Why is that? Because when we have the thought, is that God speaking to me? Was that God in this situation? Is, is this God moving in, in this? We can go to scripture and we can confirm those thoughts or we can confirm that those situations to see whether or not it was God because we see his character. We learn about his character. We know God through his scripture. We see his nature. Now, one of Satan's main tactics is to get you to become distracted and take your eyes off of Jesus and onto something else. Now, he does this through 
tons of different ways, but a main way uh, would be distracting us with the pleasures of life, right? You got to get that new car. You've got to get into that new house. You've got that new project that's going on. You've got that promotion. You've got your family. You've got this vacation that you're saving for and you're looking forward to, and you've got all of these different things. Or another way is that he'll lie to you, and he begins to whisper lies. Satan will begin to whisper lies to get you to take your eyes off of Jesus. Well, Jesus can't love you. You've done too much wrong. Oh, Jesus can't love you because you're divorced. Oh, Jesus can't love you because you've done this. Oh, Jesus can't love you because you, you messed up last night. Or don't, don't really be a part of the church. Church people are judgy. And, and, and we, we, they really, like, they, they don't want you there. And he just begins to whisper lie after lie after lie. Satan will lie, he'll distract, and he'll divide. And we could spend weeks and weeks talking about all the ways that Satan wants to get you to take your eyes off of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But I want to talk and highlight one way that we often take our eyes off of Jesus, and it's probably a way that many of you have maybe never thought about, and that's this. It's by getting us to read Scripture through an egocentric lens. Through an egocentric lens. What do I mean by that? What that means is that we tend to put ourselves at the center of everything rather than Jesus. Let me try to explain. I mentioned earlier that I grew up thinking that the purpose of the book of Jonah was about our obedience towards God. Why did I have that perspective? Why did I think that Jonah was a story about obedience? It's because I grew up putting myself in Jonah's shoes. I would ask the question, how does Jonah's actions relate to my actions? How does this apply to me? How can I not make the same mistake that Jonah made and so I don't screw up like Jonah? All of these questions centered around myself. I was reading scripture with an egocentric mindset rather than a Jesus-centric mindset. The main character in the story in the book of Jonah is God. The main theme of the book of Jonah is God's grace. It's God's grace to Jonah, and then it's God's grace to the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jewish uh, people, the, the city of Nineveh. It's all about Jesus. Can I challenge you this morning, church, that as you read scripture, that you make everything about Jesus and you bring Jesus into the center. We're going to read this morning the entire story of Jonah, but I want to actually read it to you from the Jesus Storybook Bible. This is a phenomenal kids' Bible, okay? Uh, most kids' Bibles are trash, not going to lie, but they're really bad. This is a phenomenal kids' Bible, and uh, if you want to understand why I believe that most of them are not good, Come find me after service, I'll explain. But I think you'll understand why I speak so highly of this. This is the Jesus Storybook Bible, written by Sally Lloyd-Jones. So parents, it's $10 on Amazon, hardcover. It's worth every penny. New believers, if you're just discovering who Jesus is, this is worth it. I, I, I gain from reading this Bible. This is, this is worth it, okay? So we are going to uh, read this story, and you can follow along. It's going to be kind of hard to see the words, but you can at least see the pictures, because we like pictures. And we're going to read this entire um, story here. It's titled, God's Messenger. God had a job for Jonah, but Jonah didn't want it. Go to Nineveh, God said, and tell your worst enemies that I love them. No, said Jonah, those are bad people doing bad things. Exactly, said God. They have run far away from me, but I can't stop loving them. I will give them a new start. I will forgive them. No, said Jonah. They don't deserve it. I'll run away, Jonah said to himself, far away, so far away that God won't be able to find me. Then I won't have to do what God says. It's a good plan, he said, because as far as he knew, it was a good plan. But of course, it wasn't a good plan at all. It was a silly plan, because you can run away from God, but he will always come and find you. Jonah went ahead with his not very good plan. One ticket to not Nineveh, please, he said, and boarded a boat. 
sailing in the very opposite direction of Nineveh. Well, it wasn't long before a fierce wind blew and the boat started to lurch and pitch and roll and everyone started turning green. Jonah sat bolt upright in his bed. You see, the first thing that went wrong with Jonah's not very good plan was that God sent a big storm after him. The sailors couldn't sail their ship properly. We're sinking, they screamed, and started throwing everything overboard. Suitcases, food, whatever they could find. By now, Jonah knew that the storm was his fault. Throw me instead, he shouted to the sailors, and the storm will stop. The sailors weren't sure. It's the only way you can be saved, Jonah cried. And so one, two, three, splash. No sooner had Jonah hit the water than the waves grew calm. The wind died down and the storm stopped. Just then, when Jonah thought it was all over, when he was sure he was going to drown, God sent a big fish to rescue him. The fish swallowed Jonah whole with one big gulp. Jonah must have thought he had died. It was so dark in there, like in a tomb. But then he smelled the rotting food and felt the slimy seaweed, and he knew he was, wasn't dead. He was in the belly of a fish. Sitting there in the darkness for three whole days, Jonah had plenty of time to think. Pretty soon, he realized his plan was, well, a very silly plan indeed. He was sorry for running away. He prayed to God from inside the great fish and asked God to forgive him. After three days, the fish spat Jonah safely out onto a sandy beach. Just then, Jonah heard someone calling his name. Go to Nineveh, God said. And this time, Jonah said yes. He went straight to Nineveh and told everyone God's wonderful message. Even though you've run far from God, he can't stop loving you, Jonah told them. Run to him so he can forgive you. The people of Nineveh listened to Jonah and they started loving God. They learned to do what God said and to stop running away from him, just like Jonah. Many years later, God was going to send another messenger with the same wonderful message. Like Jonah, he would spend three days in utter darkness. But this messenger would be God's own son. He would be called the word, because he himself would be God's message. God's message translated into our own language. Everything God wanted to say to the whole world in a person. Do you guys see how everything is about Jesus? It's all about Jesus. The story of Jonah is about Jesus. Jonah reached the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jewish people, and what did Jesus come to do? He reached the Gentiles. He, he redeemed people. Jonah preached repentance. What did Jesus do? Jesus preached repentance. Jonah spent three days inside a fish. Jesus spent three days inside a tomb. It's all about Jesus. Can I encourage you, church, to make everything about Jesus? Bring Jesus into the center of your Bible study. Bring Jesus into the center when you're walking your dog. Bring Jesus into the center of your parenting. And when you do, there comes a joy that is greater and stronger and deeper than anything you can fathom. We talk a lot about the culture of joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself third. When we make it about Jesus, things begin to change. Some of you this morning may have come in and you realize, man, my life hasn't been centered around Jesus I, I, I need to make a change. I've, I'm just constantly like searching for the next thing. I get in a new relationship and it's good for three months and then, ugh. And, and then I, I start a new job and it's good for six months and ugh. Can I just encourage you? Jesus is everything. Look for him in everything. Bring him. He wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants to walk alongside you and give you power. This morning, we have a lot of people who have made the decision to make their life all about Jesus. They're following a scriptural command to be baptized in water, which is a symbol of dying to yourself. It's, it's saying, I am putting to rest my ideas, my desires, and my ways, and I'm choosing to follow and accept God's ideas, God's desires, and God's ways. 
we're about ready to celebrate the fact that people have come to life. We're about ready to celebrate the miracle of salvation. But before we do so, I'm just gonna invite everyone here. Would you just close your eyes and bow your heads? I believe that some people here watching online, wherever you might be, might have realized as we're reading that your life hasn't been centered around Jesus. You've been close, but you've been more concerned with the moralistic point of stories rather than Jesus being at the center. And just by a show of hands, how many would say, I need to bring Jesus into the center of my marriage? Would you just raise your hand, just be honest right now, at the center of my marriage? Yeah. And by a show of hands, how many would say, I need to bring Jesus into the center of my workplace? I need to bring godly conversation, and I need to bring hope and life into my workplace. And by a show of hands, how many would say, I, I, I need to bring Jesus just at the center of my life where I've, I've just been living selfishly, I've been putting my ideas and desires and ways above God's ways. You just say, I'm coming back to you, Jesus. I'm coming back. Yes, there's a lot of hands. Jesus, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for this wonderful story that we read this morning in the book of Jonah about a God who loves everyone, even the, the worst of the worst, the people of Nineveh and that same God. I thank you that you love us today. And so I pray, Jesus, that as people are coming back to you, as people are setting you as the center of their lives, the center of it all, I pray that things would begin to shift. In marriages, I pray that you would bring people closer together. In relationships, that people would be brought together and there'd be reconciliation and forgiveness and wholeness. I pray for those who are searching for joy and happiness in life, that they would find it in no other place except in you, Jesus. I pray that this morning for those who are surrendering to you and saying, Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? I can't do this on my own. I want you to forgive me. I need you in my life. I pray that you would enter them in a miraculous way and that, that you would help them um, in, in their walk and you would walk beside them. They would feel your strong arms from heaven reaching down and sustaining them. I pray, God, this morning for the 30-something, close to 40 people that are gonna be baptized making their life a public outward expression of saying, I am making Jesus the center of it all. I pray that this would not just be a moment, but this would be a holy moment. That this just wouldn't be a ritual, but this would be something that sets them up for, for uh, just a spirit-filled life, God. And that you would just open up a window of heaven and shine your face down on these that are, are accepting you and, and going public with their faith. So we just pray a blessing in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen.